Caroline, Part 1 All that is good starts small. In the mother house of the school sisters, there lived an old French Notre Dame sister, Sur Walberg, who could not see any more, and the novices read for her. She told about the old times and Mother Teresa, whom she knew from the time Teresa was a little girl. If I start speaking about Mother Teresa, I have to start with how I got to Stadamhof in spite of being French. When the revolution broke out in my homeland, we lived in fear for years. Many friars and women religious were killed. We had to leave the convent, the school, the city, and even the country behind. We headed for the Bavarian Kingdom, where a few Notre Dame convents had already been found during the previous decades. On our way, we were praying to our founders, Father Peter Fourier and Mother Alex Leclerc, to lead and save us from all evil. We often lived in privation. However, we never needed to spend the night without a shelter because so, no matter where we were wandering, the French or German people were sympathetic to us. Deep in our hearts there was sorrow. Yet we hoped that if God let us endure hardships like that, we might have a plan for us in the land of Bavaria. This hope kept our spirits up. Finally, we arrived at one of our sister's convents in the city of Stadthof which lies along the River Danube, opposite the famous Regensburg. I cured my homesickness with work. Prayer, the community, the nice environment, the kindness of school children consoled me. Stadthof became my home, and I held on to it. I could find my peace. Mother Teresa, I mean young Caroline, used to live quite near us in our neighborhood. Her mother Frances taught her from a very young age that she should look after the poor. 
They baked cakes and together with the apples picked in the garden, they took them to the poor patients of St. Catherine's Hospital. The most beautiful months of Caroline's childhood were the months when she was waiting for the birth of her young sibling. She longed for a younger brother. She even had dreams about him. Her fantasy was completely taken up with the future. And indeed, the sibling arrived. It was a boy, Ignatius Gerhardinger. The young sister never let him alone. She experienced the joy of motherhood together with their mom. After four months, the little boy got ill, and one night his soul flew away to join the angels. Caroline was broken. First, she got ill and could not get up for a week. And when she was better, she became quite serious and quite introverted. Her parents were worried about her. Bigger than their grief was their sorrow for the state of their daughter who stayed alive. Yet, they never lost their trust in Caroline's willpower. They knew that she was the kind of girl they would have to stand by in the background and, at the right time, reach out their hands to her However, they knew they had to let her fight the battle on her own. They knew that in Caroline's heart, the love for life was so big that the light must win over darkness in her soul. In September, she reached school age. At the urge of our Mother Superior, she was accompanied by her parents to the convent school so she could get acquainted with the place. On this very day, Caroline, the one with thirst for knowledge, the one who was able to be happy about everything, came to life again. The sisters at the porter's door knew Caroline was quite exceptional, so they put her into the turnstile, which served to receive packages, and was taken to the cloister the very part of the house which only sisters could enter. It was amazing how immediately she felt at home. I was the one who showed her the icon, the refectory, the garden of the convent. Caroline could not get enough of the new experiences. This is how we became soulmates for a lifetime. While we were praying together at Our Lady's statue in the garden, I could see that at her age, she had a very strong relationship with God. It turned out that she and her mother got up at daybreak every day 
and started the day with prayer. They prayed the Lord's Prayer 40 times, each with a different intention. During the day, while passing the church, they always went inside, even if it was for a few minutes. She did this even without her mother. Her classmates were wondering why she goes to church when there is no liturgy. Caroline had a very close relationship with her father, too. Mr. Willibald Gerhardinger's place of work was the Danube River. He ran a shipping enterprise and spent days on the bank, where the shipments left and arrived. On other occasions, he sailed away himself and steered the boat on shorter or longer trips. When returning home, he could be sure that his daughter would run to welcome him home with passionate love. Caroline never missed an occasion to be the first to listen to her father's travel reports. Most naturally, Mr. Willibald never returned with empty hands. He brought either a pocket comb with ribbons from Passau, or a honey cake from Linz, or a doll from Vienna. Caroline made friends with a little girl at school. Anne Holtz spent almost more time at the Gerhardingers than at her own home. The house was filled with their laughter. The well they played around guards the memory of their friendship even today. Caroline was a gifted, smart, and charming little girl, more mature than her companions, and she showed that during her education. At the school, we moved her two grades of where she was. She was also permitted to receive her First Communion earlier. The sacred event took place in our chapel. It was there that Caroline asked me to become her sole mother. We were bound by numerous beautiful and honest discussions. Father Michael Whitman, the parish priest, was her confessor. He taught religion at our school. I got to know him as a wonderful teacher, outstanding priest and scholar, who never forgot the fate of the children, especially that of the poor. Caroline was a determined, diligent learner. She dreamed about working in her father's shipping enterprise and that she would, of course, travel a lot. She was happy spending time with her mother or father while they were receiving businessmen. Her godfather, Uncle Zirngable, was the most frequent client. Though she and Anna Holt were sometimes still snapping each other out of nostalgia, but it was not the games anymore that kept them together, but the long walks along the Danube bank when they touched upon countless common topics. There was a familiar, sincere relationship between mother and daughter too. Her mother Frances was happy to see that Caroline's abilities and studies were acknowledged by the sisters. Caroline was even involved into the correction of papers. Honestly, we had never made such an exception with any other student before. In 
In the spring of 1809, Stodemhof and Regensburg turned into a theater of war. Napoleon, after he had defeated the Austrian army, invaded both cities with fire missiles one night. This is how he wanted to prevent the fleeing, beaten troops to move ahead. Locked into their homes, the whole population was terrified and praying. Had not been my life in danger, I would have gone out of the convent and cry out to my fellow citizens in French, march away in peace. Huddled together, the Gerhardinger family prayed the Hail Mary, one after the other. The father went to the loft to see the crowd better. His daughter was brave enough to sneak after him. By the light of the burning houses, they could see well how the fleeing Austrians were hurrying over the bridge, how the houses on fire were collapsing. Caroline's birthday was in June the same year. As a present and reward of the excellent final school report, her father let her join him on his trip to Vienna. This journey opened up the world for her, and from that time on, the desire awoke to accompany him on all his trips. In the Stevens Dome, she prayed in front of the original statue of Our Lady, a replica of which we had in our garden. They both arrived home exhausted. There had been some complication on the way home. They were getting near a whirlpool in the river. The passengers began to panic. While the father was balancing the raft, Caroline kept on calming them. Trust my father, he will save you. There are moments in my life which I can only remember through the blur of my tears. Sisters, I let you know with a very heavy heart that our convent and school will be dissolved. I applied for the dissolution myself. No, this may strike you as cruel, but what we were fleeing from and left behind in our homeland has caught up to us here. The dangerous ideas suppress life in the convent here too. We did our best with the help of God to let our activities bless Stadenhof in its neighborhood. And we were well appreciated by our students, the parents, and the whole city. Thanks to their affection, we were given some delay, and we could avoid being dissolved so far, although all the nearby convents are empty. But now, we cannot Gracious go God, Save us from having to flee again. I kept on repeating, don't let it be. Gracious God, please, save us from having to flee again. I received the royal answer to my request today, and within four weeks, 
We have to leave the house. The furniture will be taken. Everyone needs to start a new life on her own. But sisters, trust Almighty God, who was in Egypt with his people, who was in Babylon with his people. He will not forget us either. We who have been rendered homeless in a foreign land, where we are all rootless. Let us throw ourselves on the Lord's mercy. Let us ask for help of the patrons of the Order of Notre Dame. Our Lady Virgin Mary, pray for us. Father Saint Augustine, pray for us. Father Saint Peter Fourier, pray for us. Mother Alex Leclerc, pray for us. Our Lord, we offer ourselves in the sacred mission of the Order of Notre Dame into your holy intentions. If you want, sometime we can return to our school in Stadamhof. But if you want us to be smaller, let us hope that once, somewhere, through others, we can start growing bigger again. We accept if you want us to follow the way of St. John the Baptist. The one to follow us is greater than us. For your glory and for the good of girls' education. Amen. Our friends, Caroline and little Anne, now school leavers, came to our last Mass. We had with us our novice and alumnus, Anne Prong. Watching their seriousness, the hope started rising up in me that our work might not have been in vain. How can we say goodbye to a place which belongs to you, but where you can only return as strangers from now on, even though you are familiar with everything from the cracked stone of the paving, through the knots of the tree trunk, to the sound of door's hinge? Like broken winged birds, we felt that much loss, stepping out of the protection of the cloister. My Caroline came to meet me and kept me company walking over the stone bridge to Regensburg, where I rented an attic to be my new home. Another hard day came. The equipment of our convent was auctioned off. I could not resist and went there where I let the aching moon hurt more. To my surprise, all the people that came were from the families of our students. They saved our icons personal belongings from illegitimate hands. 
When it was the turn of my kitchenware to be auctioned, there was a moment of standstill. I could sense the sympathy around me. In the end, it was all given back to me, free. Oh my God, oh my God, you did not leave me alone. The darkness of my attic was lit by the frequent visits of Caroline. Do you know how long I have been considering what the children were facing? Father Whitman was thinking about the same when after our last liturgy, he stayed there to pray. As a young man, when he studied at the Jesuits in Elmberg, he experienced what it meant for a student when his beloved teachers were all of a sudden sent packing. Now he was worried about the children who cannot be welcomed in the classrooms by the Notre Dame sisters anymore and neither can others welcome them. The school stops to exist completely and the parents won't be able to take them to school farther away. No matter at what price, we have to prevent the children from getting lost. But how can we get teachers to replace the sisters? teachers who can educate in the spirit of the sisters? And where can we get the money for the school? He suddenly remembered a trip two years ago when he took the little ones to the hills. Since the sisters could not leave the cloister, three older girls helped out. three girls were there at the last liturgy of the sisters. Caroline Gerhardinger, Anna Holtz, and Anna Prawn who was already a candidate. The Lord let Father Whitman know how to answer the problem. He would invite these three girls to work as teachers and continue the work at the Notre Dame School. First, he went to the Gerhardinger family. Although Caroline would have liked to go on another boat trip with his father, she said yes. Anna Prown lived at her brother's place ever since she had to leave the candidature. She did not really know what to do. Now, she was pleased to say yes. She knew Caroline well, as she had often taken care of Caroline when she was little. Lastly, 
Father Whitman called on the Holtz family. When little Anne learned that she might teach at a school together with her friend, she began jumping for joy. Father Whitman happily gave thanks at St. Mong Church and began to make plans about the life of the new school. They began with the preparation for the classes. It was time to make plans. All three girls took their task very seriously. Finally, the bell rang and the first class started. Father Whitman and his chaplain supported them in every way. Caroline quite often visited me to ask for some advice. After three years, they were still working with heroism and enthusiasm. Each morning, Caroline left for school well prepared, full of vigor, fresh and pretty. In the meantime, business life went on at home as usual. She checked on cost estimates, made orders and contracts, controlled invoices together with Uncle Zing Gamble. However, it was a prominent day when 15-year-old Caroline and the other school teachers successfully conducted their classes in the presence of the state committee and qualified as teachers. From that day on, they could go on teaching as registered royal teachers. Nevertheless, it seemed that all their efforts were in vain. The city commandeered the Notre Dame Convent School to be used as barracks. Disappointed as she was, Caroline was on her way to tell Father Whitman that she would join her father's business. Two of her little pupils stopped her and asked Caroline to think this through in a smart way. It does not matter if education does not happen at school, as long as the weather is fine, they might as well have classes in the meadow. Caroline thanked both of her fans for the advice. Caroline delayed the time, being postponed her meeting with Father Whitman. Instead, she entered the silence of the church to pray. End of part one.